The night sky is full of endless wonder. And sometimes, things that simply defy belief, like this giant jellyfish that seems to explode out of the dark expanse. Now, if I was to tell you that this crazy apparition in the night sky was about 60 something miles across and appeared over the heads of over 1 million people in a major metropolitan area, yet nobody saw it or even knew it was there, you'd probably think I was crazy or just simply lying to you. But that's exactly what happened this one frigid winter night as a low topped storm system raced across the southern plains. And I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time to document the spectacle going on above it. Not only did I get amazing color video and photographs, but I also got some very rare slow motion footage where so many amazing things happened, I just have to break it down separately at the end of the video to do it justice. So if you look closely at this crazy site, you probably have a number of questions. Like, what is this? And is it something to be worried about? I mean, I understand it's absolutely wild looking, like the cross between something alien and something devilish. You may also ask, why did nobody else see something so large and so dramatic? And why were you, Paul Smith, the only person to report it? And these are all valid questions. Where to start? Well, let's start at the beginning with a brief explanation of what this is. This is called a red sprite, and I'm happy to say that this is something perfectly natural and has been going on for as long as the Earth has had an atmosphere and weather. They are the upper atmospheric effects of strong lightning. What you're looking at here is the excitation and photon release of nitrogen gas in a strong but quick electric field high in the atmosphere. They are essentially giant sparks of plasma dancing over storms in the night. How can I be sure that this was not alien or supernatural? Well, because everything we see here can be post-analyzed with the radar and the lightning data. And as for whether it's something to be worried about, well, that's kind of an ongoing question among scientists, and I'll explain more about that later. Now, this sprite in particular is a pretty special one for a number of reasons. For one thing, it's something we call a jellyfish sprite, which is named for its beautiful domed head and the cascading tendrils beneath. And these, I estimate, only account for one in maybe every hundred or so red sprite events. Also, this one has some phenomenal and particularly unusual usual structure. And probably most important for this video was the fact that it was part of a rare sequence of other transient luminous events that I've never seen documented in this fashion before. I was so much intrigued by this event that I had to contact and send it off to one of the world's greatest experts on transient luminous events, Dr. Oscar Vandeveld, and I'll share his commentary later. And to the burning question of why I was the only one to see it when it was over such a populous area, well I can answer that pretty much in one word clouds because these red sprites obviously happen far above the storm so the people on the ground under this if they were even awake at three o'clock in the morning would have been in the midst of a spectacular lightning storm where the associated clouds trailed for many tens of miles from where the lightning and the sprites were happening okay but Texas is a pretty heavily populated place right like how come no other people who are far enough away from the clouds like me didn't see or report this either my answer the answer to that is that red sprites are just incredibly quick. It's almost like your eyes see them, but your brain doesn't always quite process. So these very fast flashes, even though dramatic, can get completely processed out of your perception. The closest thing I can compare it to if you're a night sky watcher is something like a meteor. The super quick ones that are only as bright as the dimmest stars and they dart in and out of existence really quick. Like I said before, red sprites are a plasma, much like what you'd find in tube lighting, but they only last for a few milliseconds, which is 10 times faster than you or I could even turn off a light switch. They are really, really quick. As such, sightings are mainly reserved for those actively looking for them in the right place, at the right time, and with night-adjusted eyes. There! Yeah, you see this face redden up! 
It is very, very uncommon to see these just by chance. So now to get into this spectacular event. Here is the sequence slowed down to 10%, then at real time in color. And from this footage, the lightning data, courtesy of Vaisala, the star field analysis, GLM flash data from the NOAA satellites, and some painful, for me anyways, mathematics, I got my size calculations, which are really helpful in the analysis. Then then with camera 2's footage, we have the sensitivity turned up and the footage is slowed down. And this reveals a whole lot more. The atmospheric zoo comes to light. Here we see a whole bunch of different transient luminous events hidden in the millisecond time scale. And they're caused by four really strong lightning bolts over northern Texas and southern Oklahoma. The first bolt by McKinney, Texas was a massive positive bolt at 247 kiloamps. This created the most complex group of events in the series. Now when you consider that an average positive lightning strike is only 30 kiloamps, this one was almost 10 times bigger, an absolute monster, and explains all these effects on the upper atmosphere. It was actually strong enough to generate a huge electromagnetic pulse that tore apart the ionosphere for several hundred miles in just a millisecond or two. This is what we call an ELF, another transient luminous event. Something I'd like to do a whole future video about because they're just rarely mentioned and are so fascinating. One really interesting thing about these ELFs is how they have a distinctive donut shape. And that is because the EMP radiates out of the lightning channel in all directions except for the top end, leading to a circularly expanding luminous reaction of the lower ionosphere with the hole directly above the lightning strike. And here's what the wave looks like at 65,000 frames per second. It's a wave that reaches seemingly superluminal speeds. And just milliseconds after this elf, the same bolt also created a particularly strong sprite halo, which are luminous ball-shaped discs of descending excitation at around 70 to 80 kilometers altitude. This descends extremely quickly and is from this that the sprite stream is developed and the heads of the sprites also fire in the the same region and persist the longest at around 70 kilometers height. Then to continue a second 74 kiloamp bolt drops around 10 milliseconds after the first and 15 miles south of its location. This triggers a sprite in the primed excited environment. And then the series continues with a third 138 kiloamp bolt up by Ardmore in Oklahoma, which seems to rebrighten the first elf while creating one of its own, along with its own halo and sprite. And then the last big bolt in the series of four drops by Denton, Texas. And it's a 116 kiloamp bolt that creates a series of curtain-like column sprites that almost seem to rain from north to south. All of this power and atmosphere churned in less than one second. It's about 96,000 square miles of chemical excitation. Just amazing. But what did it mean for people on the ground? Immediately Probably nothing, a brief static burst on a radio or TV maybe. Definitely not the technology frying EMP of the disaster movies. But it may have effects on things like satellites, rockets and balloons, basically anything that we have to put in or through the upper atmosphere. And long term did the atmosphere get changed in any measurable or significant way? Well this is something that I think is important to research, but there's definitely chemical change of nitrogen and there are likely effects on the ozone which in turn could be very important to us on the ground. So this is my amateur analysis of the sequence of events but I wanted a real expert input to do it justice. So like I said I sent the footage off to Dr. Oscar Vanderveld. He's an atmospheric scientist and specialist in transient luminous events just like these and his commentary on the series of events is based on some of the specific questions I asked. First of all I asked him, how did the initial jellyfish sprite develop from the halo? He replied, I see a big illumination across the sky, which is really the elf. The elf is overlapped by a very big halo, looking brighter, which is moving downward as typical, giving the appearance that it slams the sprites out of kind of a strainer. While the sprite is still ex 
expanding at low altitudes, a bright oval shape appears on the top of the halo. I believe that this is a green ghost. Then I asked, how do the heads inside of the jellyfish stay illuminated longer to make them look brighter in the color image? Oscar replied, interesting to me is the linear wavy appearance. I think that the sprite was rooted in some atmospheric gravity wave pattern that you can sometimes see in airglow. The light in the horizon stays alive, which means that the lightning processes inside the cloud are continuing with brightenings associated with the strokes that trigger subsequent sprites. First, a typical isolated carrot sprite at the right, which tends to have a long delay to its parent positive CG stroke. As we can see here, the delay causes it to initiate at a lower altitude than the jellyfish, which is the shortest delay kind, which in turn allows the branches to grow upward in addition to downward. There is a couple of low altitude patches remaining which could be beads or even small troll events that crawl up slowly along the old streamer channels. I also asked how the elves form and what their likely effect is on the atmosphere above a metropolitan area. Oscar replied that an elf forms as a result of a very strong return stroke current in a vertical lightning channel. The pulse propagates outward, exciting end to, that's nitrogen emissions in a ring or donut shape. Radio waves show this can alter the ionization state for many minutes afterwards. Finally, I asked Oscar, what do we know about how jellyfish form versus column sprites, why they are so quick, and why do jellyfish sprites look like they do? Oscar replied that column sprites are the classic sprites that do form at high altitude, near 80 kilometers, with the lightning being quite impulsive, fast rise time but not very energetic in a relative sense compared to other sprites. If lightning is very impulsive, a fast rise in decay and very powerful, it triggers many initiating elements scattered over a disc-like area simultaneously which only develop as long as the field is present. The slower the lightning current delay, the more complicated the sprite bodies will look as seen in carrot sprites and grouped carrot sprites because the persistent electric fields allow new streamers to move charges back and forth. So one thing is for sure, after looking at big events like this over huge populations, we do need a lot more research into transient luminous events. This kind of energy, its effects on our atmosphere and also the ground level should be something we should want to completely understand. And this is why observations just like this are so important and why I plan and interact with scientists, sharing captures with the the scientific community in the hopes that we can shed some light even just a little bit at a time. To support this work, please like and subscribe to this channel and share with people who you think may have an interest in science, nature and weather like this. I have so much more I want to share and I really believe that there's some amazing things waiting out there for us to discover. And the only way we're going to find them is to keep on looking. And if you really want to become part of the story, you can also support my work through the Buy Me A Coffee channel where all the proceeds go towards the Sprite Chasing Fund. But for now, I just want to say thanks so much for watching. Take care.